It starts with an instinct that we share with other mammals. It's an instinct, for instance, that you might see in your dog if, if your dog was sort of snoozing by the hearth and, the, and some snow slid off the roof and landed with a loud thud outside the window and your dog would jump up and growl and bark and look around. And basically the dog is asking, who's there? What do you want? It's looking for an agent in the world. This hyperactive agent detection device, as Justin Barrett calls it, is something that we share with, basically with all mammals. It's a very useful evolutionary habit to have, the habit of looking for agents whenever there's something puzzling or surprising going on. Not necessarily startling. If, if it won't rain, and it won't rain, and it won't rain, you can start looking for an agent to blame for that, or maybe one to appeal to, to ask for rain to come. That's another uh, phenomenon in life that would lead to the positing of an invisible agent that plays a role in your life. The suggestion of not just me, but actually a number of theorists, is that what this does, and has these, this is found in every culture, every culture that's ever been looked at, is a rather large population of local imp, imps, goblins, fairies, gods, leprechauns, uh, invisible supernatural agents that are uh, deemed to play in one role or another in the local culture. Now, how did that happen? The suggestion is that in the dog, when the hyperactive agent detection device fires, the dog looks around for a few seconds, and then basically this evaporates. This, it goes back to sleep. But when a person does it, because of our language and because we have these echo chambers for brains, a little rehearsal is set up. So you're out in the woods and crackle, crackle. What's that? What's that? Oh, my God. Did, who, said, who, who said that? What? What? Did that tree just talk? Oh, my God, a talking tree. Was that a talking tree? I don't think so. A talk no, it couldn't be a talking tree. Oh, no. Could it be a talking tree? A talking tree? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six little rehearsals. Six little generations of the talking tree idea. Call your neighbor over. Hey, I think there's a talking tree. He says, a talking tree? Yes, a talking tree. We now have 10, 11, 12. The idea is having offspring. Pretty soon the whole village is talking about the talking tree. That's how a meme is born. One thing to understand about evolution, cultural evolution as well as genetic evolution, is that evolution is all about things that almost never happen. Mutation almost never happens, but evolution depends on the amplification of the effects of mutation. Every birth and every lineage is a potential speciation event. Not one in a trillion is. But that's the source of all the variety on the planet. Every time your hyperactive agent detection device fires, that and you create a momentary off-the-wall hunch. I think there's a goblin out there. Let's suppose, not that 99 times out of 100, let's suppose that 999 times out of 1,000, that's the end of it, evaporates, dies. You, never, you don't even remember it for five minutes. But every now and then, every now and then, one comes along that gets rehearsed by you and rehearsed. And once it's been rehearsed a few times, it can be rehearsed a few more times, and then it's going to be spread, and now we have a lineage. It won't take long before these rare replications lead to a population explosion of sorts, and now they're going to compete for rehearsal time in brains, because that's limited. So we have a, a population explosion with competition for a limited resource. That is time and space in people's brains. Only the unforgettable ones are going to survive. The ones that are memorable, that are unforgettable, that you can't get out of your head. So those are going to be the winners of this tournament, this replication tournament in the brains of our ancestors. Now what are the winners for? 
I ask this curious question because I have found that when I tell people I'm working on an evolutionary theory of religion, of the origins of religion, they say, oh, that's a good idea. Yes, I often wondered what religion is for. It's got to be for something. After all, every, every human population we've ever looked at, every tribe on every continent, we've always found some sort of religion. It's, it's a universal. It's got to be good for something. And I say, well, yes, it's true that it's a ubiquitous feature, but it doesn't follow that it's got to be good for something. What's the common cold for? Every human group that's ever been studied has it. What's it for? It's for itself. It survives because it can. It just happens to be able to exploit human hosts and spread and spread and spread. It's not for anything but itself. And that's what the original population of supernatural agents was for. They were for occupying the minds that they find themselves in. And that's all. They have their own fitness, independently of whether they're doing us any good. Uh, about five to 7,000 years ago, these small bands of hunter-gatherers began to coalesce into chiefdoms and states. As long as the numbers are small, informal means of behavior control and moral enforcement operate quite well. As soon as the numbers are too large for these informal means, shunning, making people feel guilty, gossiping about them, making them feel embarrassed for their bad behavior, as soon as the populations are big, there's too much opportunity for free riding and for cheating the system and taking advantage of it and getting away with it. So two institutions evolved, government to set up a set of rules and everybody gets a copy, and religion, in case you think you got away with it, you didn't because there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all and keeps track of this. So this is the second part of how humans construct religions and gods because we need it for moral enforcement. It just so happens by contingency and chance, religion and government was the first on the scene. Now what's happened in the last several centuries since the Enlightenment, science displacing religion as the primary means of explaining how the world works. Something else has also happened. We've slowly but ineluctably replaced religion as the primary source of our morals and, and came up with the clever idea that you actually have to have a reason why you have uh, certain moral principles and we're going to write certain laws. You actually have to give evidence for why you think this is a good law or a bad law or a good moral principle or a bad moral principle. And that has been the trajectory of the Enlightenment since um, about 200 years ago. As we can clearly see, anthropologically, social, socially, social, psychologically, and so on. This is what people do to get along. They construct religions, they construct moral systems, and so on. We now know that we can do this without gods. In fact, we do it quite well without gods. Northern European countries do just fine with much lower rates of religiosity than we have. It is possible to do that, and that is what we've been doing. One that's been interesting me more recently is how a number of of social institutions depend on the ignorance of those that they, that they exploit. Whether it's a Ponzi scheme where the individual investors are sort of almost complicit in their ignorance of what's going on because it's not worth their while to be too <laughs> inquisitive about what's going on until it's too late. And in particular, uh, religions, I think that Perhaps the single most important change in the world, as far as religion is concerned, is electronic communication. The internet and cell phones, transistor radios for that matter, going back a little bit. For thousands of years, religions thrived in an environment where information was hard to come by, and it was, you could more or less assume that individual members of each group were not only ignorant of other religions, but even ignorant of a lot of their own religion's history and practices. And this easily maintained ignorance was, I think, sort of the lifeblood of, of religious solidarity. Now that's all changed. It's changed hugely. And I think every religion in the world is on the cusp of either going extinct or transforming itself in ways that are really radical. It, there's no other option. 
they simply will not be able to continue with the information that is now readily available. They can, they can do the, the sort of religious equivalent of Bashar al-Assad and, you know, enslave the people, imprison the people, kill the people, but if you're not prepared to put all the people basically in prison, they're going to get the information and that's going to change everything. So my prescription for what we should be doing is very firmly but gently informing, informing, informing. Letting people all over the world know about each other's religions and letting them mull those facts over. And if the leaders of those religions have to revise their practices to account for the fact that this is happening, they're going to transform religions in ways that are well, hard to imagine, but I think largely favorable. Very firmly but gently, informing, informing, informing.